developed uh, on, uh, in Italy and in Germany and in France and ended up Germany. He was, uh, he was one of the first uh, rangers when they developed the rangers. He was taken and trained in Alabama and he became a sergeant uh, throughout the, his tenure in, in, in fighting the war. Came back, back a, my, through my dad's eyes, he came back a very different man than he, when he had left. And so he was also part of the... Uh, um, what do you mean? Do you mind if we go through your shirt and come out, oh. come out the top? Oh. And he was part of the uh, uh, attachment that uh, uh, liberated the, the death camps, uh -huh. Auschwitz and all of them. Uh -huh. And then he was, when they won the war, they surrendered, he, uh, he uh, they, they, before they let him come home, he was stationed in Austria where he learned how to ski. And he came out and taught all my uncles how to ski and my dad. So I remember going to Aspen as a young, as a five-year-old and coming down the mountain with my dad, between my dad's legs, you know, mm -hmm. and the old palma lifts with the rope. And my uncle taught him. And so my uncle Al, who was Seve, he fought in the Philippines. He fought in the Pacific Theater. Mm -hmm. And then my uncle Art had just, had just got through basic training with the Air Force when they dropped the bomb. My dad wanted to join too when they all joined, but they wouldn't let him because he was the baby and the, he was the only less, last son. And so, wow. yeah. I know a lot of history. In a lot your of family. history. If you could just tell us what it was, the Chicano movement, the, the civil, I mean, you know. And now, even what is okay, it? Okay, uh, what? what no, I, mean, start, I mean, where? I started asking him, like, could you tell us about your father? Right. Um, how it was? Okay. I, oh, I think he, is that my doggy? Oh. He's in. He's over here. Oh. Come here. Hey. hey. He's over here. Right here. Get in here. Okay. Go sit down. Sir, we're good? Yeah, we're good. Okay, yeah, let's just start, uh, I guess, the beginning with um, your, your father and, uh, um, I guess, growing up when the, with, the, with his brothers and... Well, my father is, uh, uh, was born in 1928 here in Denver, Colorado, uh, in the east side of Denver. Uh, we're right now in the north side in Denver. And he was the youngest of uh, three full-blooded brothers and three half-sisters and a half-brother. And my, his dad, my grandfather, Gonzalez, uh, came in to uh, the United States from Buenaventura, Chihuahua in 1911 during the Mexican Revolution. And he settled up in the Raton area, northern New Mexico, in the Trinidad, southern Colorado area, where he was a miner. And uh, then he migrated to Denver, and uh, they were farm workers. And when my father, my, uh, my grandma was pregnant with my father and uh, ready to deliver, they were in Kingsburg uh, picking uh, produce and doing farm working, um, uh, you know, as farm workers. And sh the Kingsburg Hospital wouldn't accept Mexicans, so they had to rush her down all the way to Denver. He was born at Denver General, it was known, now it's Denver Health Medical Center. And he, um, so he was born in 1928, June 18th. And uh, his, gra his mother, my grandmother, Indalesia Gonzalez, uh, passed away with a respiratory um, illness in 19. 31, so he was about two and a half years old, and my grandfather never married again. He raised his kids, and her kids, actually, because she had four kids by previous marriage. And they married in 1918, but she passed, and my dad never really knew him, his mother. And uh, they grew up in the east side, and then my dad, they, he grew up in abject poverty. And uh, he said they were so poor that when they, later on, when he was a very famous athlete, uh, he had many different lives. This was a very complex individual. Uh, they asked him, Corky, did, do you remember the depression? How, you know, how, how did it affect you? He goes, how we were so poor, we didn't even know there was a depression. You know, so he, they, he said they moved a lot in the middle of the night. He thought that was common. And what they were doing is they were either moving into condemned houses to live or moving out uh, uh, when they couldn't pay the rent, you know, you know or were going to get evicted. And so, uh, again, uh, abject poverty. And But uh, that didn't. Uh, deter him uh, from uh, really literally fighting his way out of poverty and he he, he was an incredible natural athlete and uh, he lettered in wrestling he 
graduated high school in uh, 1944 at the very young age of 16, which is pretty unheard of for a Mexican student. Even nowadays, we suffer 50% uh, of our students don't graduate high school. And he did this in 44, and he wanted to become a mechanical engineer, but he couldn't afford the tuition. He went, uh, he worked at a, at a packing plant as a hide carrier, which is probably the dirtiest job in the world, uh, carrying the hides of slaughtered animals, you know. And uh, he saved enough money to go one quarter at the University of Denver, and, uh, but he couldn't continue to afford it. And at, so at about 15, he started boxing, and he found that it, uh, he had a really natural talent for it. And at 16, he went into the gloves and as an uh, A-class fighter. There's, uh, you know, novice, and then there's B-class to A. He went immediately A-class, and he was fighting at 112 pounds. And he won the state golden gloves, and he went to the Nationals in Chicago. And he ended up losing to Keith Nuttall, who was the eventual uh, national champion. And Nuttall was being trained by uh, his corner man. My dad wrote in his uh, uh, letter that you know, told, he didn't know if he was more worried about his opponent or his corner man who ended up, who was Henry Armstrong, Hammer and Hank, the uh, three-time world title holder, first one to win three world titles. He was a hell of a lightweight, one of the legends of the fight game. He was the, the guy, the kid's trainer, Keith Nuttall. So my dad lost, but he, made, uh, he had such a, a great showing that they invited him to the New York City, inner city gold, uh, gloves match between the national champions and New York's finest. And so that was a big break for him. And he never got to fight in that tournament because he, uh, uh, he, he would, they supplanted him with another uh, 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 a black uh, bantamweight out of Louisiana. He was very upset about that. And, and, uh, but he, he had a hell of an amateur career. He won. Um, he never won the National Golden Gloves. He lost to Bobby Bell the next year because he came home sick and he went weakened from the flu and he still lost on decision. And, you know, he beat these, all these people he lost to in the pros, but uh, he, he won, finally won a national title. He, won, he was Denver's first national amateur champion and the first Latino national amateur champion in Colorado history. Uh, in 1947, he won the national AEUs in Boston, uh, and he won at 119 pounds. And uh, he was the first national amateur champion since Eddie Egan won in 1928. Or 29, I think it was. Eddie Egan was a young, and he wasn't a Colorado native. Eddie Egan was a, actually a student at DU at that time, and Eddie Egan was a pretty good athlete, all around athlete, and he won national championship in 29, 28. And you got to understand, the 40s, the big three sports were baseball, horse racing, and boxing. So, mm -hmm. you know, he was, uh, he had a like, a, he had finished with like a 48 and 4 amateur record, and he went pro. And he went pro at 19, he fought for six years, and he retired. And actually, five of the uh, he actually came back to have a fight. That's why it was six years, but five years. So this man fought till like 25 years old, and he was done with boxing. And the thing is, is he started to demonstrate his leadership abilities, his uh, his business acumen. He managed his own career. That was unheard of for a skinny 19-year-old Mexican-American kid in Denver, Colorado, to manage his own professional career. He had managers that who were close friends who he put in as front men for him. But uh, especially in the muck and mire of boxing at that time, it was a dirty, brutal sport, and it was controlled by the mob. And yet he fought, he had a record of 65-9-1, 75 fights in five years. He was fighting 10-round main events every other week, you know, two, two a month. And so he was always in incredible shape, very uh, critical, you know, he was in great condition. Uh, he beat the best. He, he finished... Uh, his, uh, his career with the number three ranking in the world. And so that's when there was only eight divisions. It's not like 64 divisions now, it's alphabet soup. You know, you, you get eight fights, you're a champion. This, you, there was only eight world champions. So you figure you, if you're a number three in the world, you're pretty good. You know, you had to be one of the best. And so he became the golden boy of Denver. He was the Rocky Mountain News, dubbed him as Denver's number one sports draw in 1949. Uh, he packed uh, the, the fights. He christened a lot of Denver's uh, old uh, sports arenas, like the Col Denver Coliseum, Old Bears Field. He had a, uh, he fought Eddie Bergen there, which became Mile High Stadium, which it was torn down now in Vesco, where the Broncos Broncos play. 
uh, for his athletic accomplishments. He was the first Mexican-American in the state's history to be inducted into the Colorado Sports Hall of Fame in 19, April of 1988. They put him in for his fistic achievements uh, in the fight game. And then he opened, then he became a businessman. He opened the Corky's Corner, which was arguably the first sports bar in Denver, yeah, on 38th and Walnut. And then he closed that and he went into the bail bonds business and he bought into a, uh, he became a surety bond agent for Fidelity Insurance. And he was grossing upwards of 70000 a year in the late 50s. And, at, at, and he also came, went and became a strong uh, stalwart in the Democrat, Democratic Party. He became the first Mexican-American district captain in the history of the uh, Colorado, you know, for the Democratic Party in 1955. So, you know, in 1960, he garnered the most votes for John F. Kennedy in the Viva Kennedy campaign in the Southwest. He pulled the most uh, Mexican-American votes or Hispanic votes or what Latino votes. And for that, he was uh, given a job by the mayor here on, with Kennedy's War on Poverty. He was the director of that in the neighbor, neighborhood youth court. And so, you know, all of this difference. He sat on countless boards. He was founded at La Raza, the Latin American Research and Service Agency, in part with the eight other founders. Part of, he founded the Denver chapter of GI Forum, LULAC, you know, all this. And so he, he had a fighting spirit, a real big fighting spirit. And he, and the, with the Democratic Party, he was very forceful in telling him, look, I, I get you votes. I want, I want health agencies. I want health clinics in, in our neighborhoods. I want changes in our neighborhood that, that are going to change for the Mexican-American people. And you know how politicians are. You get them elected and then they say, well, well let us study the problem. Now, you got to be patient, you know. Yeah, it, it's hard to tell a, a person with a noose around their neck, be patient. And so he, he, he finally got fed up with it. And then he got fired by, in 1964 by the mayor, Thomas Kirkton from his positions, uh, the neighborhood youth corps and stuff, because he was uh, protest, he was leading demonstrations in protest. And the mayor told him, well, you can't do that. And he goes, hey, no, you didn't buy me when, the, they didn't buy me when they put me into this job. You know, he goes, I was born to be, and quoted, you know, quoted in the, I was born to be an agitator and a troublemaker, and that's what I'm gonna be. And so uh, the mayor fired him, and he led a protest against the Rocky Mountain News for some, uh, he felt they libeled him. And he ran for mayor, he ran for city councilman. This was in the early 60s. But when, the, when he broke with the Democratic Party, he wrote a, a, a scathing letter to Dale Tooley, who ended up becoming Denver, a Denver DA uh, later on in the 70s and stuff. And he wrote a letter saying, you know, uh, the, your vision and this vision is, uh, must be to uh, the castration of manhood and that you, you're all only developing, all, all I see you developing are bootlicking boot prostitutes. On this day, you know, I'm resigning from the Democratic Party and a new crusade for justice is born. And he started the crusade for justice, which he already, he already had a volunteer group called Los Voluntarios. Uh, and then that just kind of uh, said, segued into the crusade for justice. And a full, this became a full service civil and human rights organization. And it was multifaceted, um, you know. And and then um, and he wrote Yo Soy Joaquin. You know, he found the time to write that. He always he loved art. He surrounded himself with people who loved expressing themselves through the arts. Uh, incredible artists like uh, uh, Bill Longley, who changed his name to Guillermo Vasquez, who mentored Emmanuel Martinez, who is now a, a nationally and world acclaimed artist with art in, at the uh, Smithsonian from the movement era. He created the Mestizo emblem here. He, you know, it's there in Mexico, the FM. My dad sent him there in 68. My dad had a way of doing these things. Sent him there to 68 to study with uh, Siqueiros, an incredible muralist. He sent my sisters in 68 to, to study dance with the, uh, the, at the Bayas Artes in Mexico, the FM, with the National Ballet. And they brought the dances back and created Ballet Chicano de Aslan, which was one of the preeminent uh, folkloricos in the country. We traveled all over. We had, uh, and, and then he started the Escuela, Escuela Tlatelolco in 1970, and it became uh, a, pre, a pre K through college uh, learning institution that, based on Paulo Freire's uh, 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 liberatory education, give me a, stop being a bad boy. And, you know, this man, I mean, and then, you know, he started the Colorado chapter of La Raza Unida Party. 
and ran people for governor and man, you know all these different state state reps and and really um, you know and, and then uh, uh, he worked with he was incredible because this man created bridges of solidarity and and uh, with uh, the Puerto Rican Liberation Movement in New York and uh, Father Grope in Milwaukee with uh, Miles Horton of the Appalachian Movement uh, people uh, with. Dr. King, uh, you know, he spent two two days and two nights in a Atlanta hotel room in '67, uh, teaching them that it wasn't just black and white. There was a brown situation and a native, a red situation in this country. Uh, he, you know, with the Ballacourt brothers, Dennis Banks, Russell Means, Hank Adams of the Northwest Nations, Thomas Bianca, spiritual leader of the Hopi Nation, um, Cesar Chavez, Angela Davis, Stokely Carmichael, who became Kwame today, and one of the founders of SNCC and uh, you know just incredible the way he built co collaboratives partnerships and coalitions uh, with other people and other communities of struggle and uh, uh, struggle for social justice and peace and uh, you know he helped write the Plan de Aslan which came out of the first uh, and he put, he put on the first uh, first in uh, the first three uh, and the very first one the National Chicano Youth Liberation Conference which they're expecting 300, 1,500 came to Denver from all over the country, where a peace pact, an accord was, found, was, uh, was hammered out between the Latin Kings and the Young Lords, which were warring factions in New York and Chicago, huge uh, Latin organizations, of Puerto Rican and Mexican, and, and, they became, and they became, they got politicized there, and they became social justice-centered, like the Black Panthers, you know, after that. So, uh, it was incredible. It was incredible what this man produced, what he did during his lifetime. He lived so many different lives, um, you know. And uh, I, you know, all there's uh, so much here in Denver that uh, uh, you know we have because of what he did and what he produced. You know, we have we uh, our city can uh, take care of our immigrant population, and they can feel safe here because of the people that died that bled, that went to jail, that marched, that were beaten bloody by the cops uh, because of what we stood up and marched and created that respect in, you know, in, in, in this city for, for Chicanos and Mexicano people and now Latino people you know, that, that come from all over. And uh, you know, we're getting a lot of people coming in from 1070, from Arizona now, a lot of refugees are coming. And so we're providing services. We're developing services for them, and and ho helping them to find shelter. And and, and, and you know we have service shows. We run our food bank. So we've continued. My sister Escuela Plato Loco is 40 years old, uh, and, and is still the only truly liberated zone in in Colorado as for Chicanos and Mexicano and Latino people. It's based on liberatory education, creating kids who are transformers, who are spec actors and not spectators in their own world, in their communities, uh, with the uh, world perspective on social justice and peace. Um, uh, I came and took servicios two years ago and has, have brought back in a big way advocacy. I was one of the many founders of the Colorado Latino Forum who we're going into our second year uh, in January. It'll be our second year of existence. And uh, we are a statewide um, coalition of uh, uh, statewide members and our uh, mission is to improve the educational, economic, social and uh, you know uh, welfare of our of Latino people living in Colorado and uh, Jesus and uh, so a lot of advocacy my sister Nita is probably almost uh, maybe almost as well known as my father in this city you know for the what she's done with that escuela and she has been Social, you know, she's been a uh, a uh, a uh, a guest of the city, you know, many times for her activism and getting arrested for civil disobedience with the Columbus Day uh, protest, with the now immigration reform protest. So she's always welcomes the uh, the hospitality of the city on that. I've I've been arrested once for that, but. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and so I do also a lot of uh, coalition building with the black community on racial profiling. We just got the uh, written consent search law passed uh, by statewide, which really uh, targets racial profiling. 
and, 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 and puts another level of accountability on, on police in the state uh, in terms of, you know, coming up and just searching you. You know, they got to get the written consent now. Uh, we got payday lending reform passed where these, uh, you know, the uh, sharks are coming in and getting 500% interest on payday loans. And we got that capped at 34% with state law last year. Um, uh, we're working on a lot of different um, areas with the CLF, but Servicios also advocates a lot. We, you know, we're a service provider in the areas of mental health, HIV, AIDS, mental health and case management. Uh, we're the food bank for five zip codes, uh, clothing bank, child restraint seating, benefits acquisitions. Uh, we do youth and, and uh, youth uh, 16 to 21 educational and employment support, wrap around case management services. Uh, we provide domestic violence victims, uh, legal advocacy and services, also legal representation, a DV with immigration representation. Uh, and. Uh, and then we do mental, uh, again, mental health, psychiatric ma medication management. We have uh, Servicio is a 38-year-old uh, uh, organization that was a birth child and the offspring of the, of the movement, founded by community activists and still run by one, you know, still run by community activists. And that's hard to say for a lot of uh, Latino-founded agencies anymore, you know, who are so worried about always about the funding and so they, they let advocacy lapse or, or stop and I think that's so important for service providers we need to be advocates too and very strong advocates for our communities uh, especially the communities of poverty where the voiceless dwell uh, so we do a lot of that and you know and then what uh, the way I, I honor my dad the way my sister honors her father the way our family honors my dad is that we stand up and march when things aren't right and it's stand up march we're not victims. My dad believed that. Never be a victim. You know, you, you control your destiny and you can change the world. So, uh, you know, we, he embodied, he, he you know, really uh, drilled that into us. And so I hope, uh, and I hope that we embody it with what the things that we do. Maybe on a lesser level, because this man was incredible. But uh, the thing, too, is he always had time for family and, you know, like I said, he never had time for everything, but he always had time for everyone. And so that was really interesting about this man. He was such a qualitative kind of person, you know, that he was always available and accessible. And uh, I don't know how he did it, you know, because uh, I, I, I just don't understand how the, the type of energy, it was at a, 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 an incredible, um, intensive level of energy that this man reservoir of energy this man had so but you know you google him uh, there's a book uh, of his writings his speeches uh, his, some of his poetry also Yosur Joaquin his two plays he wrote uh, called Message to Aslan it's put out by University of Houston Arte Publico part of the Civil Rights series uh, you google him he's got about 47 pages on on the internet uh, you can go to www. Uh, kevivacorky.com. Uh, we have his uh, site running. Uh, you can go to Denver Public Library and go to the uh, genealogy because we gave all we archived everything with the Denver Public Library. So his pictures. I mean, they have an incredible online site about him. Uh, you can um, go to Facebook. A couple of uh, uh, professors from California put a Facebook together on him, so they have a Facebook page on him. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, you Google and it just, just reams of information about what he did and his life and his work. And, and uh, so it's incredible. Uh, we, I, I would love to write his autobiography at some point or work with somebody who, who would like to do that. We'd love to redo Yo Soy Joaquin, which was put into film. In fact, it was the first uh, cinematic endeavor of Luis Valdez and Daniel Valdez and Teatro Campesino. Uh, they put it uh, to film in 69. And um, uh, you know Luis is the producer and director and, of Zoot Suit and La Bamba and Danny's an actor and taught Linda Ronstadt how to sing in Spanish and helped her uh, produce and, uh, and helped her put out the Canciones de Mi Padres and he, he had his own album out, Mestizo, and incredible, uh, incredible artists, those two. So, you know, I'm I mean, I think that's it. I gotta go. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow, awesome. <laughs> but that's a lot. <laughs>
you know, I mean, oh my God, you, can, uh, you know, I give two hour, three hour multimedia presentations on him and the Chicano movement. So, you know, I go through uh, video, uh, DVD, CD, music, uh, poetry, uh, lecture, all kinds of stuff. I do it all over the state. So, it's, it's a little interesting, ain't it? Yeah, I mean, if you get the opportunity to... Uh, <laughs> What'd you think? You, you're going to have to go to some of those sites, right? No, I definitely... And he was...